Hello, I'm John David Ebert, and uh, I just thought it was time to sort of come out of the closet, as it were, about my spirituality. Uh, as many of you know, as many of my subscribers know, uh, I've been posting a lot of videos lately about experiments that I've been conducting with the medium, the, the very talented medium, Shruti Campbell, uh, from London, uh, via the internet. We've been interviewing various dead philosophers, and I think uh, there's been a lot of eyebrows being raised, and a lot of my subscribers have been wondering uh, whether I've gone off the deep end, or, uh, you know, if I'm flipping out, or something bizarre, or is this just a thought experiment, a what-if game? Uh, so I thought I'd take the time now uh, to spend a few minutes with you to clarify by sort of going through my spiritual autobiography. Uh, I think that might help shed some light on this. Um, <clears throat> There is by no means an incompatibility between belief in spirituality, and that includes a belief in the reality of the other world, and the intellect, and being an intellectual. All we need to do is uh, reiterate the names of Pythagoras, Plato, Goethe, Kant, Schelling, Hegel, uh, Rudolf Steiner, W.B. Yeats, James Joyce, all believed in the reality of the spirit world, and that's pretty heady company. Those... Those are some bright guys there. Those guys aren't exactly, uh, didn't exactly have a problem with their intellects, and they saw no incompatibility whatsoever with being uh, a hyper-intellectual as well as having a belief in the reality of the other side. So those of you who maintain that there is a conflict between being intellectual and being spiritual are wrong. So let me just put that forth first and then develop uh, a thesis from there. Now, there is no conflict, as Joseph Campbell used to say, between science and religion. The conflict is between the science of 2000 A.D. and the science of 2000 B.C. So there is no conflict between science, per se, and religion, per se. However, <clears throat> as I'm finding out, as I go on this journey uh, to map out the cartography of the other side, which is what I'm trying to do, map out that cartography and then bring it back uh, to this side for everyone else to uh, participate in it, and derive fruition from it in their endeavors in one way or another. Um, there is no conflict between the science and religion per se. However, uh, science is fine as long as it minds its own business and doesn't trespass on the sphere of religion. And this was what Immanuel Kant set out to do with the critique of pure reason. That was his whole point uh, in separating out the domain of the understanding, Verstand, and the domain of the reason, Vernunft, two different faculties. And Verstand uh, has to do with the brain's ability to cognize a world in space and time with the categories of the understanding, quantity, quality, relation, and modality, of which, as Schopenhauer said, causality was really the only really key category there. So you've got space, time, and causality that the brain, uh, the neocortex, is specifically designed to orient us to. And in orienting us to it, it learned how to develop tools. Tools uh, that begin with Homo habilis, as far as we know anyway, the first to shape stone tools, the first to think conceptually, and thereby probably the first to have language. Uh, most anthropologists are wrong in thinking that language is, comes along late. Jean Owl was certainly wrong in the clan of the cave bear when she has Neanderthals just speaking in sign language. That's wrong. Uh, language goes way back. Uh, it's tied to the ability to conceive of things intellectually and abstractly and to form and shape the material world uh, into tools that can be used for technical purposes that extend the psyche's desires out into time and space. Okay, so that's the earliest origins of technology. Now Kant's point about the, uh, the, there really isn't a conflict as far as he was concerned between science and religion either, so far as science minded its own business. Science is something that has grown out of that moment when the first homo habilis shaped a tool, uh, just like in 2001 with the famous jump cut with the Australopithecus using the bone, later we get the spaceship, the most famous jump cut in history. And that is correct. Science has come out of the first shaping of that first stone tool. Um, and so its job is specifically to orient us in space-time with causality, to analyze matter, break it apart, give us a knowledge of how everything works and where everything is at, cosmologically speaking. And in doing that, in pursuing that endeavor of giving us a correct model of the cosmos, it has demolished and dismantled, deconstructed and deflated all the old cosmologies that were purveyed to us through the religions. The biblical cosmology is wrong, dead wrong. And we know that for a fact now. Science has given us this. 
and traded that out. But in getting rid of the cosmology, uh, we don't want to throw out uh, the baby with the bathwater here. I hate using cliches, but it's appropriate. We don't want to do that uh, because religion had it right insofar as there is a spirit world. There's another side. Souls exist on that side. They incarnate. They reincarnate, as I've learned. There is a God. Um, I'll tell you in a second how I arrived at all this. I figured it out over three decades. This wasn't something that came to me overnight. Uh, this isn't a symptom of a religious convert who goes from one extreme, let's say atheism, and flips overnight in a conversion process to another extreme, gloms onto this or that uh, dogmatic ideology, uh, becomes a Christian, and then suddenly believes in the, real, the literal reality of the Bible. Uh, this isn't any of that. This is a three decades long process here of bit by bit figuring it out with my brain. I happen to have one. Uh, as most of you know, it's quite seen and rational. So uh, how did we do this then? Okay, let's start at the beginning. The beginning was that um, my first book was generally, I started out in the New Age, as everyone knows, interviewing guys like Deepak Chopra. And, uh, you know, who else did I interview? William Irwin Thompson, um, New Agey guys. Uh, but people like uh, Deepak Chopra, and I think Eckhart Tolle, Though they're wonderful for what they have to offer, the problem I had after writing that book and interviewing those guys about their spirituality uh, is that they always present the intellect as a liability. They seem to have this idea that the intellect is destructive, that it prevents you from living your life, that it's in the way, and that it needs to be dismantled and wiped out like a cancer, like beaming radiation at a cancer tumor. That's wrong. <laughs> decidedly wrong, the intellect has built civilization. We wouldn't even have this without the intellect. We wouldn't even be having this conversation right here via the internet without the intellect. It is fundamental to the endeavor of civilization. So the New Age guys are wrong. So that led me to believe that there must be something better than this, than what these guys are saying. I like their spirituality. Uh, I was still, however, uh, atheist, more or less, I was spiritual, but I didn't really believe in the reality of the afterlife. Uh, I didn't think in, that reincarnation was correct. It didn't seem right to me. Um, the belief in God, none of that appealed to me at that time. But then I read Rudolf Steiner. And so as I read Rudolf Steiner, uh, he was a 19th century German mystic who was also a hyper-intellectual, just as smart and bright as Hegel, Schelling, Kant, Schopenhauer, or any of those guys. But he also happened to have the ability uh, uh, to channel the other world. He had a kind of mediumship ability to channel the other world. Uh, and so as I'm reading these texts by Steiner, book after book after book, and I lived in San Francisco between uh, 2000 and 2005, and all I did was read Rudolf Steiner during that period. Read him voraciously. Um, and I, he, Steiner's very addictive. But as you read him, he makes all kinds of incredible statements about reincarnation uh, in his the series Karmic Relationships, he goes into the past lives of everyone, you know, Darwin and Marx and Engels, and um, it's all very fascinating, but I read it as fiction. I read it like one would read Tolkien, as a kind of, cre as, as a kind of interesting mythological cosmogony that can't possibly be, no, nothing about it could possibly be true, but the way he thought it out, uh, the intricate architecture and elaboration of it and the beauty of it, uh, and he was so bright. The, the guy was just a genius. Um, that started to open me up a little bit to the possibility, what if what some of what Steiner said, obviously all of it can't be true, some of his claims are absolutely outrageous, uh, but on the other hand, um, this guy was really smart, and you know, maybe he was onto something, maybe there is something in what he said that might be true, uh, maybe reincarnation is a possibility, I don't know, I didn't know, because I didn't have any way of validating it, so... The years went on and went by. And finally, I came to a period, a crisis period. I'd had a divorce. Uh, this was back in 2008. Uh, and I was very depressed and upset, drinking a lot. Um, and then one night, I decided to go onto YouTube and look up near-death experiences out of curiosity. Um, so I typed that in. And uh, a lot of these near-death experiences are uh, take place at conferences where 20, 30, 40 people will get together, and one by one, they'll file onto the podium and relate their near-death experience. So I just sat there and listened. 
to experience after experience after experience after experience until finally I'd gone through like, I don't know, a hundred of them, something like that. And I listened to them, analyzed them very carefully and began to start to come to the conclusion that, yeah, I, I guess actually the afterlife is real. There is a God and the soul does survive uh, because in analyzing all the different experiences, I began to realize that they were all describing the same country. Um, if I get people coming to me, I've never been to India. How do I know India exists? I don't. I've never been there. Never seen it with my five senses. But people come back and they tell me they've been to India and they say, this is what happens in India. This is what the Hindus believe. And it's consistent. Everyone who comes to me and tells me they've been to India says basically the same thing. After a while, I start to realize there is a country called India. People go there and they come back. And it's a real place. I have to have faith on that respect even though I myself have never been there. So India is real. Um, I don't need to go there to prove that it's real. I'm sure when I get there, I'll see all kinds of new things that these people who told me about it didn't tell me about because I'll be using my own senses and have a unique sensory experience of it, but I'll still experience India. So that's the kind of logic that you have to make. And this is called inference. And inference is totally acceptable in science. Uh, without inference, we wouldn't know anything about exoplanets. Exoplanets we can't see, in case you didn't know this. Uh, we can't see them. Their existence is inferred by the behavior of gravitational wobbles of stars. And the, the wobbles are such that they can predict the sizes of the planets going around that star, how big they are, uh, what kinds of planets they are, whether they might have water or not. Scientists can make a lot of inferences based on a very small amount of data because the brain's smart. They can figure this shit out. So using inference, I started to figure this shit out bit by bit over time. This was a slow, gradual process. And then I came to Bob Olson, uh, searching on the Internet. Um, Bob Olson is interesting. If you go to his channel, it's called Afterlife TV. Uh, Bob Olson was a private investigator, so one of these sleuth guys, a, a very hardcore, uh, no bullshit guy, atheist. Uh, you're not going to get anything past this guy because he figures shit out. Um, so he's one of these guys, one of these types, and then his dad dies. He loved his dad, and it broke him. It just ruined him. And he began to wonder if maybe, there, maybe his dad did exist somehow on the other side, and if so, would there be any way to communicate with him? He started playing around with ideas out of his grief. Um, then he started experimenting with various mediums. Uh, and it was frustrating for a while until he found the right medium who could relay information from his dad to him that only he and his dad could know and that nobody else, including the medium, could not could, could know. Um, that convinced him, changed him, and transformed him. And so now he's got a very fun uh, ch channel, which I highly recommend, Bobbles and Afterlife TV. So um, I'm not interested in flaky, new agey types. Um, I don't like those types of people. Uh, the kinds of seances that went on in the 19th century uh, with theosophists, and table tapping and knock. I avoid that shit like the plague. <laughs> no thank you. That's not going to work for me. It's got to come through the intellect or it's not going to happen at all. So all of this has been coming through the intellect. And Bob Olson uh, is a guy, who I think, whose opinion on this I can respect, simply because he's, he was such a hardcore skeptic to, to begin with. So then I discovered uh, Elisa Medus. Now, Elisa Medus uh, had another channel where not too long ago, uh, she was an atheist, a, a doctor uh, by trade, also atheist. But her bipolar son uh, was this 20-year-old kid named Eric Medus who committed suicide. He just one night sh shot himself through the head. And her grief was so intense and profound that it just wrecked her whole life, changed the structure of her family. Everyone began behaving differently. Uh, and it was totally catastrophic on the family. But her grief was such that uh, when her son got onto the other side, he tried to contact her, but he couldn't get through that wall of grief that she surrounded her with. Grief, you see, is a low vibrational frequency emotion, and it walls out the higher vibrational frequencies of the other world. Now, this idea about frequencies, we should talk for a second about this, because um, here's what I think is happening. You've got the electromagnetic spectrum, and we see only the visible world that is visible to our eyes, our ears, our sense of touch, our five senses, 
and it vibrates at a relatively slow frequency. But as you speed up the frequency, it shifts into the invisible with ultraviolet, uh, what is it, ultraviolet ra radiation, then X-ray radiation, and then finally gamma radiation. Gamma radiation is going at a very high frequency. We can't see it. It's not available to our senses. Um, what's available to our senses is matter, which vibrates at a very low, slow vibrational frequency. And heavy emotions like anger, fear, jealousy, hatred, those also vibrate at a very low, slow vibrational frequency. But what's beyond gamma radiation? Suppose gamma radiation, you speed up the frequency even beyond that and really speed it up. Then I think what happens is you start to get to the spirit world. The spirit world is vibrating at such a high vibrational frequency that it's, it's unavailable to us on a day-to-day -day basis. We cannot access it. And so uh, that's what I think it, our, the relation with this world and the spirit world is. It's on the spectrum of matter that moves up until it gets so refined that it's beyond our capacity ever to experience. This is totally consistent, by the way, with Kant in the Critique of Pure Reason, saying that reason, not the understanding, which is tied to the physical world, reason, Fernuft, is the faculty for handling the ideas of the reason, God, freedom, the soul, immortality, uh, and science can't touch that. Science has to leave that stuff alone. Science cannot bully us into accepting uh, its shallow, empty, materialistic view of things. It's given us airplanes, computers, TVs, all this wonderful stuff, so therefore, everybody thinks that because it has proven itself in the arena of reality, that its word is final. It absolutely is not. It's only designed to sharpen and intensify our experiences on the material plane. It has nothing to do with the higher vibrational frequency of these upper worlds. So, at least his grief was such that Eric could not get through to her, but he was getting through to the relatives. Uh, to the, he would appear in the dreams of her relatives uh, and I guess I think it was her brother who contacted her one night and said, you know, Eric's been appearing to me in my dreams. I think he's trying to get through to you. And then he even saw Eric's ghost uh, one night. And it started to loosen up, I think, at least his grief a bit to the extent that one night she saw him. He was hopping up and down on her bed and she saw him. And he was finally like, Mom, you can see me now, right? Finally? Okay, so there's that. It sounds preposterous, of course, except that. Um, Elisa contacted a medium to communicate directly with her dead son, and they began having conversations. Uh, Elisa, of course, realized it was her son. Uh, you're not going to get anything fake past the mother and her son. The mother will know if it's her son or not. There's no getting around the mother-son uh, bond. And so um, then they started at some point interviewing celebrities. Eric had the ability to go to the other worlds and grab whoever he wanted to talk to. So I started watching their videos, interviewing Hitler, interviewing Jesus Christ and the Buddha. And I was very skeptical about this. I mean, when I was watching these videos, I was like, you got to be kidding me. There's no way. But I suspended and bracketed my skepticism and just set it aside and watched the videos. And pretty soon I started to become more and more sympathetic to it and less and less skeptical and finally, the thing that did it was the interview with Howard Hughes. Now, nobody knows who Howard Hughes is. You can't ask the person off the street and say, who's Howard Hughes? They're going to say, I, I have no idea who you're talking about. I didn't know until Martin Scorsese made his movie, uh, The Aviator, with Leonardo DiCaprio about him. I had no idea. Uh, but um, I researched Howard Hughes' life because I did an entire chapter on him in my book, Dead Celebrities, Living Icons. So I know a lot about Howard Hughes. I read biographies about him. I know all kinds of details of his personal biography that no one else knows who isn't a Howard Hughes scholar. And the medium that they were using was this, I don't know, I forget who it was, no disrespect intended. Uh, I think she was a millennial, but not a person who would, who had ever heard of Howard Hughes, much less know anything about him. And in the interview, all these details of his childhood were coming through. Uh, the, the troubled relationship he had with his mother, um, the bacteriophobia that his mother imprinted on him, uh, the death of his father and what he had to do, the struggles he had to go through to take control over his father's estate. All this data was coming through, and I was totally astonished. I was like, okay, it's Howard Hughes we're talking to here. There's no doubt about that. So from that point, I started wondering, I wonder if I could find a medium to, like, 
interview my favorite dead thinkers because if Elisa and Eric can do this with celebrities, uh, maybe there's some way uh, that I could do it with like my favorite dead people. Like I'd love to talk to Oswald Spengler. My, you know, my favorite book is The Decline of the West, as everyone knows. So one day after my mom died, my, my mom died last year, and um, for the first time I did indeed hire a medium to communicate with her on the other side. It was definitely her. There was no doubt in my mind about it. So I'd already had that experience and gotten that out of, out of the way. And then uh, so I, st I asked Elisa if she had any interest in interviewing like Joseph Campbell or people like that. She said, no, not really, but you can contact any of the mediums on my website um, and try them. So I fished around. I sent emails out. Finally, I sent an email out to this individual named Trudy Campbell, living in London, uh, a computer programmer, very high intelligence. Uh, she got back to me, and she said, I've never done that before, but I'd like to try it. It might be fun. She didn't know anything about philosophy. So she got back to me, and we set a date, uh, and then we interviewed Oswald Spengler, and I was convinced from that interview that it was definitely him. I, I know Spengler's personality. And I don't study, I, I don't interview uh, anyone whose biographies I haven't studied and that I don't know really well. You're not going to get bullshit past me and pretend you're talking to somebody whose life I've studied in detail, written about, and know very well. Uh, I'm not a gullible individual, in case any of you have wondered. Um, so it was him. And then so we just proceeded from that point, and I thought, well, that's, I mean, I was very intimidated to interview one of my idols, and I was totally freaked out by the experience. I couldn't even believe that it was possible. So we, you know, we went from there to do Nietzsche. Nietzsche's personality came through wonderfully and amazingly. So did Schopenhauer's irascible, dark, moody temperament come through. He didn't even want to do the interview. He was, like, vaguely shitty at first, but he was nice. I mean, and so we just went from there, and so... Um, I think what Trudy is doing is absolutely real. It is absolutely what it appears to be, and I will vouch for it. This is a three-decade-long project of research that I've invested into this. Uh, and most people don't want to believe it because they don't think it's possible. And I didn't think it was possible either. It was a long, slow process uh, for me to warm up to this. Uh, but now I think it's real, and now I think what's happening is, um, ironically, Science is what destroyed religion for us because it wiped out all the religious cosmolo cosmologies. Um, we know that the Earth isn't the center of the universe, that all the planets revolve around it. We know that's nonsense now. We have a totally different cosmology thanks to science. Um, but science, uh, you know, the religions got a lot of things right too and a lot of things wrong. The things they got right were the axial relationship to the spirit world the reality of the soul and God. And with the Hindus, they got right reincarnation, whereas Christianity missed the boat on that. Uh, they got it right, as did the Orphics and the Pythagoreans and a number of clusters and sects. Some of the Gnostics also believed in reincarnation. Uh, those guys all got that stuff right. But where these religions went wrong is the fact that um, they all emerged in a world that wasn't globalized. They were all local transformations in little islands and isolated pockets of the world that didn't see the big picture of the world and had very specific social mores, social customs, social do's and don'ts that they used the religion to create a metaphysical uh, transcendental anchoring in, uh, as though the caste system in India had anything to do with the other side. It doesn't. It's strictly the Hindu way of organizing their society. But they had to for reasons of the fact that religion creates societies, they had to pretend that it was metaphysically grounded in the structure of the way things really were. They got that wrong. It's not. Um, and so we have to separate the local ethnic inflections uh, of what this or that particular time and place has this or that way of treating women. Let's say in Islam, women are treated very poorly and unfairly. Uh, that is not something that you can anchor metaphysically on the other side. That won't work. Uh, the relation to Allah, yeah, perhaps, yeah, that, that's fine, but not the, not the mistreatment of women. Each of these religions has gotten all kinds of things wrong, and they've specifically gone wrong when it comes to organizing society. But they got it right insofar as their local horizon worked okay. Now, with the aid of our technologies, first with the satellites designed by Howard Hughes himself, who designed the ATF-1, the first telecommunications global satellite that made 
possible, a telephone call between JFK and the minister, uh, prime minister of Nigeria, live. Um, that came out of the mind of Howard Hughes. And all these globalizing technologies now, uh, with the internet coming along, have made possible a new civilization, a global civilization, whereby the essence of religion now needs to be extracted from the local core inflections, which are invalid. Those are no longer invalid. We're looking for the core that the religions got right that is immune to the bullying of science. Don't, don't let science bully you into believing that matter is the only thing that matters. That's not right, and that's, we don't, you know, that's, don't let people like Richard Dawkins and those kinds of guys bully you into believing that because they've got a really refined understanding of matter uh, that that's all life is. It's, that's totally wrong. So, um, so that's, that's, that's what's happened here. So now what we're trying to do, uh, we've broken through to the other side here, and I think now we're on the cusp. For the first time in history, the possibility now exists of uh, – creating a new religion, a global religion, that for the first time in history actually corresponds ontologically to the way things really are. Um, that's the thing. And the irony of all this is that it's been made possible by science. Um, we wouldn't have so many near-death experience accounts as we have now if the technology had not been improved for reviving people from heart attacks and so forth. They're over there on the other side having near-death experiences and then their body is able to be reactivated to pull their souls back. There's like a magnetic attraction between the body and the soul. If the body's working, the soul will be magnetically drawn right back into it. Many of them are report being very disappointed by that fact, by the way, because they like the other side so much better. Um, and so they get sucked back into their bodies. But it's, it's um, now we have all these numerous reports, more and more and more of them all the time, of accounts of near-death experiences. Sit down and read them. Or even better, just... Pull them up and watch them on YouTube. There's hundreds and hundreds of them. And I had never read uh, Raymond Moody's book, Life After Life, which was the pioneer for this back in the 70s. Um, reading takes a commitment. You have to sit down with it. It takes time. But the Internet is instantaneous. All this light speed entertainment, all this light speed knowledge and information uh, is just available at the click of a button. And so when I did sit down to read Life After Life by Raymond Moody, after watching all these YouTube accounts, I was totally bored with it because I already knew more than what was in that book just based on watching and listening and carefully analyzing all of those YouTube accounts. So all of this is being made possible now by science and technology. It's actually restoring our relationship to the spirit world and the afterlife. And that is kind of astonishing. I mean, when it comes down to it and you look at it, that's pretty amazing. Uh, the science, you know, destroyed religion for us, and now it's bringing back the possibility of a new global religion based on the way things actually really ontologically are. This could change everything, people. This is big stuff. It could be totally revolutionary for the relationship of the difficulties of life on this planet to the other side. Um, I'll reserve another video now from this point uh, talking about what I think uh, – is going on with respect to the reasons why people reincarnate, all the karmic involvements, all the stuff that I've learned about why they choose this or that life. Uh, this, I think this video is already long enough to establish the basic core principles of uh, what I think I'm on to here, uh, that I'm breaking a path open to the other side and trying to bring that knowledge back to this side to illuminate the world and light it up again. <laughs>